and welcome to this special episode of Mission Makers brought to you from Davos, Switzerland during the World Economic Forum, where me and my team were really lucky to be on the ground curating some amazing spaces and discussions this year, from the future of mobility with the astronaut Nicole Stott, who has spent over 100 days in space, to curating workshops around neuroscience and primal movement at the House of Balance, where I exclusively premiered my music track Infinite Being that features Deepak Chopra. I'll be interviewing key visionaries and thought leaders from these communities such as the Female Quotient, 100 Women at Davos, Finnish Flow and many more over the next few weeks to share the best of our collaborative insights on implementing solutions while digging deep into our collective consciousness to take responsibility for the protection and preservation of this world. So let's dive straight into today's conversation with Mark Terrell, the founder of Undavos, which is undoubtedly the biggest underground community of young global leaders, global shapers, tech pioneers and futurists really asking the big questions at Davos. Hello and welcome to this special episode of Mission Makers brought to you from Davos, Switzerland during the World Economic Forum, where me and my team were really lucky to be on the ground curating some amazing spaces and discussions this year, from the future of mobility with the astronaut Nicole Stott, who has spent over 100 days in space, to curating workshops around neuroscience and primal movement at the House of Balance, where I exclusively premiered my music track Infinite Being that features Deepak Chopra. I'll be interviewing key visionaries and thought leaders from these communities such as the Female Quotient, 100 Women at Davos, Finnish Flow and many more over the next few weeks to share the best of our collaborative insights on implementing solutions while digging deep into our collective consciousness to take responsibility for the protection and preservation of this world. So let's dive straight into today's conversation with Mark Terrell, the founder of Undavos, which is undoubtedly the biggest underground community of young global leaders, global shapers, tech pioneers and futurists really asking the big questions at Davos. So it's our final episode of this year's coverage from Davos and we're closing it out with a super special episode recorded live from the Swiss mountains at Finnish Flow with our honorary guest Nicole Stott who is an astronaut that worked for 27 years for NASA. Finnish Flow organises some of the most sought-after evenings in Davos, with previous guests including Deepak Chopra and Sadhguru speaking at their events. And their mission is to really create evenings where global leaders come together to co-create a better future. They also take care of their Finnish business delegation members who are attending the World Economic Forum. And this year, I was super honoured to moderate a session with Nicole and two other guests, Sergio De La Vega and John Crates on the future of mobility. After this, we've got three very special episodes um, on Mission Makers. So the first one, um, as some of you guys may or may not know, um, I recently debuted my, my first string of music releases. And this was a very significant milestone in my career because... I've spent more than seven years really affecting the art of music production and and getting really comfortable with my sound and and everything. And uh, I was really, really honored as well to to release on the best labels in dance music. So doing a little episode about that journey um, and also just some advice, you know, for for fellow music producers who are, you know, on that similar sort of path and and, and sort of thinking about how to get to to the right labels. Because, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a long journey. The other two episodes, um, I was also really, really lucky to be at uh, International Music Summit IMS in Ibiza this year. And similarly, very honoured to to have the opportunity to moderate two very, very interesting sessions. Um, the first one was with Danny Howard from BBC Radio 1, really around his career and also the evolution of radio and, and having such a legacy of a, of a show on BBC Radio 1. And the other one is with Marshall Jefferson, who is a legendary producer and widely known as one of the founding fathers of electronic music, because in the in the early 80s, he created um, the house music anthem Move Your Body. And it was literally, you know, one of the first ever music records. It became so iconic. Um, and we had the opportunity uh, to, to sit down with him at IMS and really talk about this journey. Actually, he made this song in a sort of pre-computer era where there was you know no um, digital software and yeah it was an amazing session and it was brought to you guys by Point Blank Music School where I'm a, I'm a lecturer so yeah stay tuned for those two episodes coming out in a couple of weeks on Mission Makers. Laura Nanji, I'm a podcaster, journalist, lecturer, race car driver um, and founder of a podcast agency called Mission Makers. 
mobility, it's something that affects each and every one of us in the room. How we move as a planet is as exciting and transformative as it is alarming. As a race car driver and DJ, like many of you, I spend a lot of time traveling around the planet. And flying into Zurich this week for Davos, it was really heartbreaking to see just from the air how little snow was covering the beautiful Swiss um, Alps. So I think we all know that, sadly, we are speaking at a very fragile moment in our, in our history of humanity. The world isn't on track to meet its climate objectives, and there are major tensions in the energy sector that will require extraordinary levels of alignment across policymakers, corporates, and investors to neutralize energy threats without derailing the clean energy transition. So today we're going to explore the incredibly important future of mobility, both from the perspective of being here on the ground on Earth and from the lens of outer space. So I'm extremely honored tonight to be joined by John Crates, the CEO of Rocky Mountain Institute and a widely acknowledged leader in global energy. Nicole Stott, a retired NASA astronaut and engineer who spent over 100 days in space and 27 years with NASA. And Sergio De La Vega, who is one of the early investors in Formula E and chairman of, of um, Citizens Company. So the first question I'd really like to ask all of you guys is, what is the key element that makes mobility important to you? And what is the number one thing that you prioritize above all else in your approach to mobility? Well, I'll, maybe I'll jump in here first. And I do, we've heard some depressing things here about the state of the planet. Um, I, at my institution, Rocky Mountain Institute, we practice something called applied hope, right? Which is the idea that we can will into existence the world that we want and need, right? But we need to practice systems change. We need to practice transformation in the end to get there. Um, and so we try to create examples of transformation. Now, the, the mobility sector is critically important for us here when we think about you know, creating that sustainable uh, future for all of us. Uh, and when I say all of us, I mean the planet in its entirety. Transportation is the fastest growing emission sector. Uh, when we look at it, whether that's in China, whether that's in the United States, whether that's in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, in each of these regions, we see the fastest growing areas as being transportation. But it's also one where we've seen real, real progress here, especially on the electrification front. Um, now, when we think about points of optimism today, on the planet, solar and wind are more cost effective. They're the cheapest form of energy for 95% of the people on the planet. That wasn't true a year ago, it wasn't true two years ago, but it's true now. And the idea that we can take this very cheap form of, of electricity, of this energy, and that we can use it then to power how it is we move goods and people across the planet. That is the single driving force for us right now at Rocky Mountain Institute to understand how we use energies that flow and convert them to allow people to flow. So that's, that's kind of a, a quick uh, summary. I'll get into some of the case examples here soon, but, but the idea that we've got plentiful and cheap energy that we now need to convert, and we can do that. We can do that technologically. We can do it socially. We can do it quickly in a time frame that's relevant to this most urgent planetary crisis that we're facing. Thank you. Nicole? Well, I, um, following John with like a bit of a philosophy um, idea is uh, having worked for NASA for 27 years and blessed to spend some time in space, I think back to some of my early mentors um, working there at the Kennedy Space Center on the space shuttle program. And, and all of this space stuff, it's really complex, right? And the way we were taught as young engineers to deal with that, real, that complexity was, first of all, to go into any problem you're trying to solve with the belief that there is a solution to the problem. And then the second thing was our motto across the board, which was to operate in a way that was based on here's how we can, not why we can't. And that kind of philosophy, I think she puts you in the, the position to believe there's a solution to the problem and to be very actively involved in making sure that that happens and taking down the barriers to anything that somebody might want to throw in your face that you just want to um, 
discard, not ignore, but um, move forward from. Now, when I think of mobility, um, to me, it means connection. And the, us having the ability to move around the planet, and I'll keep it terrestrial at this point, um, I mean, allows us to be in places like this, to exchange ideas, to meet new friends, and to understand that we have more in common than different. And that is a real, I think that's a really compelling part of solving problems. And then I, I'd like to follow a little bit again with John here, the idea of the, the renewable, the sustainable energies. I think of, that allows us to power the mobility and other things, the best way for us to really look at that is to maybe take a step back and consider some of the sci-fi kinds of things that have already become sci-fact in our lives. And the other kind of sci-fi stuff, for example, something called space-based solar power, that we could bring to life right now and provide energy to our entire planet by doing that off the Earth for the Earth. And then for mobility, I just want to say that um, that sci-fi, sci-fact thing, I am a total Star Trek person, and I'm really looking forward to the time when we have those transporters, because I think that'll solve a lot of the problems. Amazing, thank you, Sergei. And mobility is freedom, is social justice, right? How can I exercise my right to health or education if I don't have a way to reach the hospital or the school? So I think it's very important for all of us. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, it took us more than 100 years to realize how inefficient combustion is, right? When we burn fuel in our cars, we waste 70%, almost almost 70% of the energy. That energy doesn't become movement. It becomes, it turns into noise, heat, and emissions, right? And we are paying 100 years of emissions now. We saw the pictures before, so. Uh, but technology, I mean, in a way, was we, this inefficiency was kind of hidden by the low, historically low cost of oil. Right, oil has been historically very cheap, albeit of the fact that we call it uh, the, the, the black gold and so it's, it's very cheap, right? And um, lately with uh, technology, uh, other, techno other technologies like solar or, or renewables in general are getting to the level of competitiveness that oil has had historically, and that's what's pushing the agenda. Uh, today, uh, electric mobility is not driven by uh, environmental activist is driven by economics, and I, that's why I think we're seeing so much progress lately in it. I think it has become mainstream. I mean, I'm, I've been involved in electric mobility for almost 10 years, and I've been, I've been crazy eight out of those 10 years, right? There's been too much skepticism, and I think it continues to be, but uh, I mean, I'm seeing tremendous changes. I've seen, I mean, we're expecting... Uh, almost a uh, revolution in terms of uh, energy storage and batteries and so we're at the very beginning of, of the race. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we're gonna, probably in 10 years time, we're gonna be telling ourselves how could we be burning fuel for so many years, right? And we were crazy doing it. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's very true and it begs a lot of questions. Nicole, you've done something that so many of us in this room can only dream of. And earlier on in the green room, I was sharing with you my dream of being able to be maybe the first DJ in space someday. Um, and I think, you know, it's a burning question that many of us will have is, is how did ch space change you when, you when you went up there and you finally came back down to Earth? Uh, well, I, I do think it was life-changing. Um, it's certainly... I don't know, you know, to have an experience, and I think we have them here down on Earth too, those pictures we saw of our planet, the other worldly places that are available to us that, you know, have not been explored yet right here on Earth. Um, they open us up to the, the awe and wonder that surrounds us, right? And to how, you know, and to how hopefully we can be part of the solution and maintaining um, not just the beauty of that, but the life-supporting nature of it. And I think that having that experience in space, um, and I mentioned all the complexity, you know, complex thing to get to space, to just live and work there for a short period of time, to come back to Earth, and yet it comes down, I think, really for me to 
the simple lessons that I learned there. And those are three very simple things. We all know them in this room. I would um, hope that you will all will want to bring them more into your daily lives. Um, we live on a planet in space. I mean, I know that's an obvious thing, but when I looked out that window, that was one of the first things that came to mind is like, oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. Oh my gosh, that's a planet. I didn't have that in my daily life before that. We are all earthlings. Another obvious yet sometimes not thought of thing. And the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets and protects us all. And if I think if we, in our daily lives we would consider those things, they are also at the basis for solving all these planetary challenges we have. Just considering those three realities. And then if we start behaving like crewmates and not passengers here on Spaceship Earth, that's another major way for us to just regroup and think about probably our most important role as, as Earthlings is to save the, the life-supporting nature of our planetary spaceship. Absolutely, and hopefully we don't need to go to space to understand those three very uh, simple but yet so complicated um, understandings. Sergio, you've been at the forefront of taking risks with um, you know, game-changing series such as Formula E. Um, what kind of what are some of the key factors that investors should consider when investing in early stage investments, and how can we attract more investment into the mobility sector? I think the answer is risk, right? I mean, we are we, we when we get into new technologies, we are taking risk, and it's unavoidable, right? And um, and uh, it's just a game of finding a way to mitigate into the risk by not putting all the eggs in the same basket, or by taking any other action that mitigates risk as the only way you can survive on those things. Um, we um, have noticed lately that um, uh, there is so much innovation in the mobility space, but many of these innovators don't make it through because going to market is very difficult, right? I mean, you get together with a bunch of very smart guys to build a new vehicle, a new solution, uh, just to realize that Going to market is much more expensive and much more difficult than, than, than expected. And, you know, if you are not lucky enough to find the right mentor, the right sponsor, the right um, investor, likely your product is not going to make it. So um, that's in a way, and it's going to be like advertising, but that's why we created the super cool mobility centers to give these innovator, those innovators and those new companies the opportunity to go to market, right? And also, I found that there are so many companies that have the need or the conviction you know, of uh, lowering and reducing emissions, and uh, they just struggling to find solutions. So how can you have, in one side, all these innovators trying to make it through, and then you have all these companies trying to find the right solution, and there is no, there's a disconnect, right? That's what we're trying to bring. So, I mean, this is based on our experience. We started uh, investing in uh, electric mobility, sustainable mobility in 2012, and most of the companies we invested on are today that, right? So I think um, we, we learned the story and we want to make this, create a solution for the rest. So maybe it will be a way to make some of those losses back. Absolutely. And John, we know there's an increasing need to, to ensure that our mobility, safe, um, mobility future is not only safe and secure, but equitable and access for all. So what are some of the innovations that you've been seeing that can ensure that there is going to be this um, benefit for everybody in this transition towards clean energy and, of course, talk, touching maybe on some of the threats that are happening right now in the sector as well? Hey, I hope you're enjoying today's show. And of course, if you are, a little review or share with your friends would be much appreciated. But I just want to take a quick pause to share some interesting news that Mission Makers has unexpectedly grown into becoming a boutique podcast agency. And for the last year and a half, we've secretly been producing content for some high impact brands from tech unicorns in Silicon Valley to disruptive companies at Davos. So if you're thinking of starting your own show and you're looking for some help, then send us a message because we would absolutely love to bring your story to life and help you amplify your content while really connecting on a much deeper level with your audiences. Now, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I, so one of the really exciting things, we've seen solar costs go down, we've seen wind costs go down, now we've seen battery costs go down, so that over the last 10 years, they've reduced about 82% in overall cost, which starts to make this economic story, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, that Sergio talked about possible, right? Um, but 
if we get to 2050 and only half the planet makes it to net zero, fundamentally we've lost, right? So we do need to figure out the way to act as crewmates here and create the right ecosystems that build out successful dissemination of technologies that are, that are clearly cost effective. And I've talked a bit about electric mobility, but it's also about hydrogen for things like shipping. Uh, uh, it's also about things like sustainable aviation fuel for things like aviation that we need to pull together. But one example of a system level change where we're all acting as crewmates is that RMI worked together with the government of India um, alongside 130 companies, including a bunch of startups and some of the large entities like uh, Walmart and Flipkart and others, some of the, the TNCs uh, that are also there, to figure out a way to actually create demand for electric vehicles in the urban centers of India. Now, this is hugely important, not just from a carbon perspective, but from a pollution perspective and minimizing the amount of uh, toxic air uh, there is in the urban environment. And together, these cities, or these companies, all created a standard for zero carbon deliveries of people, of, of individuals using uh, shared ride share. And in the first year here, we've had over 100 million deliveries of zero emissions packages, or people, right? That was done by a group working together, committing, certifying, and now India has committed to take this idea globally and is helping to champion the process that it used here in a way that starts to build out that capacity of larger communities to address the challenge here, right? Now, we've, we've, got, we've got big challenges. It's not like we don't have a petroleum supply chain that is going to resist this, right? And we don't have, we have real actors and real business interests and real employment issues and, and all different aspects of this change that need to be addressed. But if we work on it together and if we recognize the fact that we really are on spaceship Earth here, right? And we've got one planet that we've got to manage, we have the solutions and we have the ability to come together and bring everyone along. Uh, and to have everyone benefit from this, this better world that we can create. Thank you. And talking about Spaceship Earth, Nicole, <laughs> um, how will, can you share with us you know, some of your observations and, and, and work that you've done on how the development of new space-based technologies will shape the future of transportation and communication on this planet? Well, I mean, I think communication and transportation are some of the major ways we've seen the space influence already um, here on Earth. I think it's gonna continue probably exponentially as, especially as the energy issues start to get resolved. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, am all, I am actually really hopeful for that transporter. And, and, and maybe it's not gonna materialize in the way that we saw it on Star Trek with the little you know, glowy lights and the spinning thing, but, um, but I feel like there's ways that we're going to be more collectively traveling because of what we're learning from flying in space. Um, we might even be using spaceships to fly suborbitally from point A to point B that ends up causing less issue with the environment than what we're doing with um, our current aviation model or some hybrid of that I think that's gonna evolve over time. Um, I think we, we don't even really know what we have to look forward to, except that I think it is going to have a very positive influence on communication and mobility in ways that we you know, can't even really imagine. And what about the future of space tourism? Um, I, I mean, I'm all for it. You know? I, think that, I think that tourism is something that, it, again, opens our minds. It opens our hearts to the awe and wonder that's around us. I think we need to um, utilize the space-based opportunity for that as it's available. I, I would love to see, I mean, I highly recommend <laughs> the opportunity to fly in space. And um, the more people that have it, I think we'll have more appreciation for this, this fact that we live on a planet. We'll want to come back like every astronaut I know and take action as a result of it and encourage action in others. And um, 
I just think it's part of the evolution that we're going to see. And what's going on in, in space tourism right now is um, really the baby steps that are allowing us to get to the point where space exploration from a commercial side especially is um, bringing to life the real underlying mission of people like Bezos and Musk that is not about just suborbital flight. It's not about five minutes getting a, you know, going on a, a joy ride. It's about how do we lift the industrial issues that we're having off the planet into the relatively benign environment of space for the benefit of everyone on Earth. How do we um, populate space in a way that allows us to utilize the resources in a more efficient and equitable way here on the planet? And how do we continue to realize that everything we're doing in space is ultimately about improving life on Earth? Absolutely, really well said. Sergio, as a fellow petrol head, I would love for you to uh, expand a little bit for our audience on how Formula E can impact the future of mobility. Well, I think Formula E has been more of a, of a message, right? I think it's been um, uh, started um, nine seasons ago, so nine years ago, um, as, a, as a way to convey a message and amplify the message, right? Uh, Formula E was trying to prove to the people that electric mobility was a fact, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a show, it's a sport, but it conveys that message, right? And I think uh, he's not the single driver of that option of mobility today, but he contributed to it. And I think uh, like that, we, we will see so many technologies that will be pushed through some sort of entertainment, because music and those kind of things also drive and induce behaviors, right? We are humans. Of course. And what about um, some of the challenges moving forward um, where, or opportunities for, for the sport? For the sport? Yes, yes. Look, um, I think most sports are living, you know, one of the best moments. So it's hard to find a threat, but definitely, you know, there is, there's, there's a threat to it. But just look, at the end of the day, this is, I think... Um, uh, for this, for the purpose of this discussion, um, it has served its purpose. I mean, it has already conveyed the message. So I, you know, um, I see more companies, more sponsors shifting from the more traditional motorsports with our fuel base into this type of new sports. There are a, new, a lot of new e-sports, which is not electronic, but uh, electric sports emerging. Uh, the audiences are very different. Our people that are, I will say, are more conscious, are more uh, innovation-driven, and um, and again, we still have. I mean, I, I still run into a lot of as, as, as skeptical people about the the, the, the future of uh, mobility, electric mobility. I mean, there are particular newspapers are very popular, widely read every day. That they are they are detractors of mobility, right? I mean, there is a lot of misinformation about the availability of the materials that are necessary to make batteries, I mean, the length of the life of the batteries, and so So I think, um, you know, challenges will be about we collectively understanding and finding the right way to do it. I mean, we can make mistakes. Don't make me wrong. I mean, if we, if we transition too fast into electric mobility, the world is going to be a chaos, and there's not going to be enough grid to charge your cell phone, you um, I mean, operate your refrigerator and charge your car. I mean, there are many challenges with it, and there's, we, this is not a magic and it's not a magic solution, right? And there's got to be some sort of tolerance on all of us and uh, and responsibility. We have to act very responsible, right? We just cannot assume that this is a solution and let's go with, with let's go for it. I mean, just. No, of course, and that's, of course, where due diligence uh, plays a huge role as well and accountability. Um, finally, as we wrap up this panel, I'd love to ask each one of you, what are the new developments in mobility that you're most excited about? John, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I, uh, I am excited by the pace and scale of technological development. I think hydrogen two years ago 
you wouldn't even have considered it a, uh, as being economic within the decade. We can now see very clear pathways, especially alongside some of the policy support that's been put out there, that within the next two to three years, we see hydrogen ramping at scale, which is a critical technology, again, for some of the, the heavier uh, duty transportation uh, elements. When I think about, you know, kind of other innovation that's happening here, um, sustainable aviation fuel, similarly, uh, we were seeing corporates come together in different ways to build up. Right now, it costs five times more to buy sustainable aviation fuel than it does to buy traditional jet fuel. And none of us are willing to pay five times more per flight, right? So, but corporations are starting to buy that down and we're seeing policies come in that get these technologies on the learning curve and get us to a point where within this decade we can start chipping away at some of these real emission sectors that we really need to tackle. And it is, it is this constant social and technological uh, and um, you know, kind of uh, uh, system level innovation that I see as the greatest cause for hope right now. Everything John said. Because <laughs> I, I think that's, I mean, that's at the heart of it. And then I am, so my husband and I already like took our cars down to one, right? We looked at the way we operate and we're like, okay, we can be down to one car, it's electric. Um, but my, my hope is that I don't need to own a car. I'm real, I am looking forward to the self-driving, um, you know, ride share, um, really very thoughtful, deliberate transportation. Um, and then that to me extends to when I want to fly somewhere, how do I do that in the most thoughtful, sustainable way? Uh, and I think it, it, it crosses all, all areas of, of mobility. And, but, but when we can get to the point where I don't even need to own a car in a place that traditionally you cannot just walk and get to places, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to that day. Yeah, for me, I, I, we use energy to move energy, right? I mean, we use a three, three and a half tons truck to move one ton of cargo, right? We use a two tons car to move ourselves, uh, we weight 80 kilos, 90 kilos, right? So we use, a, we move, we, we spend most of our energy to move the vehicles that transport our goods and ourselves. And we started to see a lot of innovation on that, right? I mean, electric assisted bicycles, uh, three wheelers have been figured that's the kind of project you're looking at in India, right? So, I mean, a lot of solutions that in which we are starting to consider the weight of the vehicle in the whole equation. And that's what I see. It's, it's a very simple formula. It's so obvious. And I see a lot of innovation happening over the next few years on that space. I mean, one, one thing that will allow us to do that is a very basic factor. I mean, a vehicle, a normal vehicle, an internal combustion vehicle, concentrates a lot of weight in one point, which is the engine, right? An electric vehicle, you can distribute the weight anywhere you want because you put the batteries wherever you want and then you make a very stable vehicle. You can make it lighter. I mean, there is a, that brings an enormous space for innovation. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate all of your thoughts. And hopefully this has planted some seeds for transformation on how we all collectively and individually approach the topic of mobility. A huge round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed having this conversation. If you want to grab a copy of today's show notes, then head over to missionmakers.com forward slash Davos, where you'll also find notes from all of our previous episodes. If you're interested in talking to me about future opportunities at Davos, producing podcasts or coming down to some of my music and motorsports events, then you can reach out to me at missionmakers or at dj.n1nja on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you as ever for listening. The music played in today's episode is an exclusive preview of my upcoming track with Deepak Chopra, which was titled Infinite Being at Davos, and it will be coming out later this year. So until next time, keep it laser focused. We call ourselves human beings, not human thinkings, uh, not human doings, but human beings. So, you know, as you're listening to me, if you would just try this as you're listening to me, be aware of that which is listening.
potential intention of being me unless we transcend the mind. Except as a presence, period. So I has no form, and because it has no form, it has to be infinite. Anything that has form doesn't matter. The Milky Way galaxy has a border. The universe, even now, has a border. It's 47 billion light years away from us. But anything that doesn't have a border has to be infinite, which means I is infinite. <laughs>